Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. What we're going to be doing in this last lecture of week two is talking about selecting an atomic spectroscopy method. One of the things I think students often miss out on when they take analytical chemistry is that in the end of the day, you need to be able to decide how you're going to do a measurement. And to be given kind of cookbook laboratory experiments takes away that ability to begin to critically analyze what's the right method to do the analysis problem at hand. It's a tough thing to teach, but it's why I put the case studies into this class. And in this lecture, I hope by showing you my thought process and some examples, you'll be able to approach your case study in a better way. So some notes on this process of selection. The key things you're trying to achieve is to get some clarity by doing the reading of what's the measurement context? What's really the problem that your customer has? Why are they making the measurement or asking you to make the measurement? The more you understand about the context, even if it doesn't seem to be directly relevant to the analysis, the better you're going to be able actually to make the right measurement. And then the second thing are the measurement needs. What are the three to four key measurement needs of your customer? And one of the really tough things to recognize is they're not going to be able to tell you. Usually you've been hired because you're supposed to be the chemist. And they're not going to say, you know, I need this detection limit. And it's got to be easy to run. And They might be able to give you a budget. But beyond that, they're not going to be a lot of help. And you're going to have to learn how to prioritize and decide what's really going to matter long term to meet what you think their needs are. And so defining the context is those couple of sentences that captures the essential features of the situation. The measurement needs start to drill down to more specifics that then connect you to the choices that you're going to make. So one of the most important questions to ask right away in any measurement context in atomic spectroscopy is what elements do you need to analyze? So shown here is a periodic table. And not every atomic spectroscopy can measure every element. And there are some elements you just can't apply atomic spectroscopies to, as shown in the white. So your first stop is to say, OK, what systems do I need to measure element x? Now luckily for you, since you're caring about lead in your case study, it doesn't narrow you down much, because just about everything we've talked about can be used to measure lead. The next thing that you're going to be applying, and it's a pretty rigorous standard, is the detection limit. So what is the detection limit that you need to have to meet the customer needs? That means you need to know what's the anticipated range of concentrations that you might expect in the samples. Or if there's a regulatory limit, then you don't really need to measure a lot lower than that. You just need to be able to tell that something's below it or above it. Typically speaking, if it's a regulatory limit you're after, you want to go be able to measure 10 times beneath that. So you don't want to set your detection limit right there for all the reasons we talked about. You want to be 10, maybe 50 times underneath it. And you don't want to over-design either. If you only need a detection limit of 10 parts per million, it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend the extra bucks to get something that lets you go to 10 parts per billion. So match the instrument again to the customer needs. Shown here is a diagram, and these are kind of rough uh, estimates of what kinds of detection limits you have for the key spectroscopies that I expect you to know. The one that we haven't talked about, but I welcome you to go read about on the web, is hydride generation AA. So you can X that out. Finally, once you've sort of narrowed down or not your atomic spectroscopy is based on what elements do you have to measure and what are the detection limits, then you turn to issues of cost, issues of operation, issues of laboratory facilities. And this summary table, I think, goes over it really well. One thing that I'll point out is that it's really important to understand if your customer is going to have an analytical laboratory. Because things like ICPMS in particular are such powerful analytical instruments, if you're going to put them out on a factory floor, they have no hope of reaching the detection limits they were designed for. Um, and you also might have a really hard time supplying the gases that you need under those environments. You might be better off with a more rugged, durable, easier to operate system. And this table gives you some constraints and information about some of that. So I encourage you in your reading materials to kind of look over these issues because they will come into play in instrument selection, both in some of the examples I'll ask you about on your problem sets and also in now I'm going to go through now I'm going to go through three examples with you so you can see how my logic works, okay? And for this, I'm going to be reading, so I'm going to take my picture out and hopefully you can see um, which things I prioritize and which I don't. OK, so in this first case, you are at a refinery making gasoline. And there is a regulatory specify the level of lead to less than 10 parts per billion. You have a lot of sample to work with, but you don't have a full analytical chemist on site. 
So in my measurement characteristics, I kind of summarized. I like to set my detection limit about 10 times below um, the regulatory limit I'm trying to trying to get after. Big company probably has a good budget, but you don't need anything portable. The key drivers here in terms of measurement needs is you must, must be able to measure one part per billion lead. That's a measurement need because it's tied to regulation. And you need to do that fairly precisely and accurately. The next thing I know is that you don't have a full-time analytical chemist on site, which probably means you don't have a really great laboratory environment. So you're going to have to be careful in selecting an instrument that maybe can be unattended or can operate with a very low amount of infrastructure. So I would say your key sample needs are A, the ability to measure a lead at one part per billion detection limits, B, an instrument that can be operated by a non-analytical chemist, so the PPB detection limit limits you pretty much to ICPMS and graphite furnace AAS, if you go back and look at those charts. Since you don't have an operator and you only have to measure one element, graphite furnace AAS is really your best bet. The really the downside of atomic absorption spectroscopy is it can't measure a ton of elements. It's really good at measuring a single element very, very precisely. But if you really want a whole bunch of elements, forget it. But in this case, you just need lead. And the really great thing about graphite furnace is it's you sort of heat it up and forget it. So it can actually be operated unattended, sort of. And so I think it's a better best than something like an ICPMS, especially because you don't have the facilities you would need to support the highly clean lab that, uh, environment that is vital for running an ICP at these very low detection limits. OK, let's do case study two. So now you're in a major food company, so good, you're going to have a lot of money. Uh, and you have to measure a whole bunch of elements. You don't have regulatory limits, so you're really after concentrations above 5 ppm. So I would say your detection limit needs to be, again, at maybe 500 parts per billion detection limit. You're going to need to be able to detect a lot of different elements. And it would be great, and it would be great if it could be automated. Because it's not driving a specific regulatory measure, and you're more doing it for making sure you're not poisoning your customer. So what I would say here, and the really big driver here, is that you've got to measure a whole bunch of elements at once. And there's really only two choices, and it's going to be ICP AES, the atomic emission, or the mass spectroscopy. In this case, I don't think, since your detection limits are not really low, it would be overkill to go with ICP MS. You'd have a really high infrastructure cost, and it's actually expensive to maintain. So I would probably go with ICP AES. Case study three another food chemist. And we have a regulatory limit at one part per billion lead in arsenic. Now, in this case, I have a less than one part per billion. I could have put down 100 parts per trillion, but that's getting down into detection limits that are really, really hard to achieve. So, you know, it's got to be a really, really low detection limit. And you have to analyze for a bunch of other metals. So, what are you going to do? You have high, well-trained operator, but maybe poor lab facilities. And because you're working with milk, because you're going to have high amount of total dissolved solids, which means you're going to have some pretty arduous sample prep. you got to get rid of all the fats and all the stuff in milk, because if you injected milk into a fancy atomic emission spectrometer and you sucked it up through the straw and you put it in the torch, the torch would basically be trash. All that quartz would get junked up with carbon, carbonaceous materials, and you would be in deep trouble. So sample prep is actually going to be a really important thing for milk. So in this case, it's a tough call what you would do. Part per billion detection limits are pretty limiting. It means you can't use atomic, atomic absorption. You have a lot of metals, maybe not graphite furnace. Since the lab is dirty and you have TDS issues, not, IC, not ICPMS. So what I would probably do is go with the ICP AES axial. That gets you to a lot of different elements, kind of close in the detection limits, depending on the metal you're after. And it's a lot less sensitive to total dissolved solids. But in any case, this is going to be a really hard thing to do because you just don't have a lab and a trained chemist. So this is a tough case. So what I will and leave you with is sort of how I think about this. There was a lot of information I had in my head from the reading material. So it's super important you read. And I encourage you to talk to other people in the class as you go through, particularly these kinds of decision-making processes. They're very hard to formalize. It's more of a synthetic and a critical process that I'm asking you to engage in. Think about the sample size. Do you have a large volume of sample, a little volume of sample, whether or not you're constrained by cost, and whether or not precision and accuracy play into this choice. As you can see from the table, 
that's actually not a real discriminator among these different methods. They all basically give you pretty good accuracy and precision, and much of that is going to come in in the quality control conditions in the laboratory. So, you know, it tends not to be a driver in your instrument selection. So I hope from these examples you've learned a little bit about how to approach these more open-ended problems that are a little bit more amb ambiguous. And I do expect that you might be a little frustrated because it's hard for me to write down a recipe for exactly how to approach these problems. But I'll give you some examples and hopefully you'll be able to work through some concepts in the problem sets. So thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.